Interesting. The when when you were in Japan, what what is real? What did real estate look like in Japan back then, or even now? So okay, so real estate's gone straight up with QE essentially. That's um, that's what I would think, right? With, especially with interest <laughs> rates so low, it's just like why not borrow for thirty years and you know make the spread, right? A lot of people have done that. A lot of people have and continue to do that. Um, there. Yeah, I mean, I, I've never been a huge real estate investor, either directly or indirectly through, you know, through REITs or through real estate developers, just because I've always been attracted to the liquidity profile of investing in the stock market, right? So if I get something wrong, I can turn around, get my money out immediately, right? right. Essentially. Um, and look, a lot of these, a lot of these real Cause, estate because there are trades, a lot of there, right, are, they, there are there are and, well there are a lot of Japanese companies. I think you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I've seen quite a few. Where you'd have just a ton of real estate on a ba- on a balance sheet of of a of a stock. Yeah. Yeah. So so look, the original kind of uh, what's the word for it? Impetus for that for that phenomenon was the '80s bubble, right? So you know, Japan had the world's biggest stock market bubble in the '80s. Everyone's probably heard the old uh, the old uh, anecdote that um, the land under the Imperial Palace in 1989 was worth more than the entire state of California. Right, so no one has ever seen a real estate bubble like the Japanese stock and real estate bubble of the late eight nineteen eighties. But that was essentially the beginnings of of what you're describing, right? So a lot of companies owned some land. That land took off in value. They borrow against the increased value of the land. They use that borrowed money to buy more land. They pyramid on up and up and up. And obviously that would provide fuel for the market. You know, this happened for a decade, then it all blew up in 1990, essentially. And so then in Japan, they spent the next, you know, 10, 15, at least the next 10 years trying to repair the financial system because all the real estate collapsed, which meant all the banks collapsed. They merged, you know, from eight or nine big banks to three or four big banks. Half the regional banks went bust. A lot of the securities companies went bust. Um, and, and then there were a few companies, you know, some of the better credits still had land on the books that got marked down a lot, but, you know, then they, they kept it and, and then it started going up again uh, in, say, the late – in, say, from, say, 2010, let's say, um, why, once QQE why do these, really kicked off. Why, why do these companies keep land that they're not really using? It seems like a very Japanese thing. That's that's the uh, sixty four thousand dollar question. Why do why do any of these Japanese companies own half the things they own that they <laughs> they don't really need? So is there is there is there a, is there a cultural thing there that? Um, there's look there's there's definitely an element where you know the Japanese public company is a bit like an empire, right? So. You know, there's an old there's an old uh, saw about Japanese companies that every second Japanese company owns a golf course, right? <laughs> So probably because the chairman likes to play golf, right? Okay. Um, but I mean, culturally, you know, Japan is an interesting place because we think of it like a, a capitalist democracy. It's definitely a democracy, but they're not really that capitalist, right? So they talk about stakeholders. And when they talk about stakeholders, they mean first and foremost, employees in the company. Then they mean society at large. Then they mean maybe shareholders number three and a distant number three the vast majority of japanese companies don't exist to serve shareholders in the way we're used to in the west they basically are there to to support the 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 corporate unit which is viewed as a second family and the reason for that is lifetime employment was a big part of the post-war uh, appeal to japanese right we, you will work really hard uh, for probably meager wages but you'll be treated like a family member at this company you'll never be fired um, you'll have a real uh, emotional stake in the well-being of the company. That kind of promise was never made to investors, right? So, so I mean, look, that's a that's a huge cultural holdover. It's changing slowly, but a lot of the, the strange behaviors you see from Japanese companies, right? So, there's this Japanese company, for example, right, called DIC Corp. Okay. <laughs> they make print. They make printing ink. By the way, I have no position in this company. They make printing inks. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a couple other businesses. It's not a small company. It's a few billion market cap. Um, but they also have one of the largest collections of modern art in the world that the, the value of their modern art collection is probably worth three times the market cap, that's, that's so but bizarre. they don't even disclose, they don't even disclose what they own. Really. It's basically a private museum, uh, in a random part of Tokyo, uh, because the, the founder of this company was really interested in art. Uh, and yeah, he <laughs> built up his collection starting in the sixties and seventies, you know, there's Basquiat's in it. There's. There's Coons, is a Jeff Coons pieces in it. I mean, there's multiple hundred hundred pieces of work 
if you even tried to market to market the stock would pro- and, and, and put out you know uh, some kind of uh, assessment of it in an equity research report the stock probably go up might might double or something but, but there'll never be any activism know, there right ex- exactly exactly that's the thing so you know the 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 it's not a matter of, and we can we can talk about this, I guess, when I come to my investment philosophy. But it's not just a matter of finding cheap stuff, right? Japan is the land of cheap stocks. Right. The last bastion of net nets is Japan. It's not good enough to be cheap. You also have to be able to get the value out, and that's why I think thinking like a creditor is actually really valuable. Because as most good creditors will know, part of the security is getting repaid. So part of the security of having a credit claim is getting that carry, right? Getting that ten percent coupon, or getting that cash flow sweep. In other words, you know, for distressed companies, creditors will often only provide credit when they get a piece of the excess cash flow generated by the business. So if you think in those terms, it doesn't matter how cheap it is if it's just accumulating on the balance sheet and, if you, and you have no way to access that cheapness. You always have to find a way to try to catalyze the cheapness and get it into your pocket.